Hello everybody, thanks for inviting us to this rather sad occasion. Uh, there you are in far away Sydney and here am I making a recording in Illinois. So I'm just going to say a few words that uh, follow on from what Mary was saying, elaborate a little bit. Um, you know, as Mary um, said, you know, Gunter um, uh, has led and, and, and we have run, uh, led these parallel lives, if you like, for the last um, 30 years. You know, what we've done intersects sometimes, a lot of the time it doesn't intersect. I mean, we do work around pedagogy and curriculum. Uh, we do work, um, or we've done work recently around e-learning and computer media um, learning environments. But there is one strand of um, our intellectual lives that we've shared with Gunter pretty consistently for those, um, these past three decades. Um, and this is something that might loosely be called literacy in the singular, or we might want to disrupt that and call it literacies in the plural. And of course, we have wanted to do that. And in a way, um, you know, thinking back and working back over our lives uh, in that time, um, I mean, we've kind of had three phases, um, two phases of which we've, we've had solidly working with Gunta. And the third one, we would like to be working with Gunta, but it's sort of, we've drifted apart somewhat. We haven't seen him now for a couple of years. Um, uh, so I thought what I'd do is I'd talk about the journey that we've had um, over this time and the journey that we might still have had, um, but we will have it virtually, even though he's not with us. So the first phase of these three phases was the genre work in Sydney, where we got involved quite politically in disrupting the writing K-12 syllabus, which was this systematic um, whole language progressivism of a rather naive variety. Um, um, then the second phase was really after we left Sydney. So by this time we were, we'd moved to Townsville, uh, Gunter had gone to London. Um, we pulled together what we called the New London Group to try to talk about this idea of multiliteracy, literacies, pluralizing literacy. Um, 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 and really, in a way, anticipating what was about to happen with new media, the internet, uh, digital technologies and communications and so on. Um, and there, the strong ideas were around uh, multimodality, but also the, the other aspect of the plurality of literacy and multiliteracies was these highly divergent, non-standard discourses, according to discourse communities, cultural diversity uh, and so on. And I think probably the most uh, productive and generative work that Gunter brought to that as discussions was this notion of design, which we've stayed with ever since, which it's not about the way in which the world is patterned and we replicate those patterning, that patterning. Um, it's about the way in which the world is constantly rebuilt and constantly moving as a result of these processes of designing, redesigning uh, meaning and transforming the world, transforming ourselves uh, in the processes in the process. So, you know, even though we'd gone to Townsville and then Melbourne after that, uh, Gundra had gone to London, we stayed connected because we had these regular learning conferences um, and Gunter attended those just about every year, to be quite frank, and we even held two of them uh, at the Institute in London in, in that, that time. Since we've come to the US, we've kind of, uh, Mary and I have started on a third phase, which I'll, I'll try and tell you a little bit about now. Um, we decided four years ago or so to write um, a multimodal grammar. So, um, you know, how does one describe the world of meaning in a way that doesn't privilege a language? Um, and, you know, four years later, we've produced two um, possibly strange books. Uh, they're coming out with Cambridge University Press um, later this year and early next year. They're both finished. One's at the typesetting stage and the other's at the copy editing stage. And in a way, what we've done also in those books is we've returned to our roots as historians. I mean, we go, we try and uh, we explore the history of um, history of ideas, but also what we've tried to do is do an archaeology of the digital. Where are these peculiar artifacts in the world of digital communications? Where do they come from? Where, how are they originated? And what do they mean? Now, um, uh, what we've done along the way in this uh, reformulation is we've taken ideas that they're essentially uh, formulated by, by Gunther, formulated in our conversations, but also very powerfully articulated by Gunther. And we've tried to push them a little bit um, further. One thing we've done is we've, I mean, the mode is a concept which 
is in reality very poorly specified. Where does, what are the modes? They're not just things that are different. Um, so what we've done is we've decided to um, build a counterposition between two kind of axes of analysis. Uh, and we call these form and functions. So instead of mode, we're talking about forms of meaning. And function are shared um, semantics, if you like, which can be uh, represented across different forms. So form and function have a nice kind of history in, um, in a number of areas, architecture, in the social sciences, in literary analysis or whatever. So um, we try to build on that distinction. So what we've done, um, and again, I think Gunther would you know, approve of this. We've, we've kind of tried to build a typology of forms which is reasonably well specified and reasonably well delineated. And these forms that we've tried to analyze, uh, we call text, image, space, object, body, sound, and speech. But what we've done is we've, we've um, decided to define text purely as written text. And in fact, an even narrower definition in, for the digital era is anything that can be expressed in Unicode, which includes phonemics, includes uh, um, uh, uh, ideographs like um, uh, emojis, for example. Um, so anything that's being expressed in Unicode is text. Um, and one of the themes that we've been building upon, and again, I think uh, this is constant with what, what Gunter has been thinking, is the radical difference between text and speech. Uh, and in fact, um, even though we have these hybrid forms um, which seem like text-ish speech and speech is text, uh, like text messaging and, and the like, um, 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 that in fact what we're identifying is, if anything in the digital era, a divergence between uh, text, as in written text, uh, and speech in terms of as a form, you know, as a, as a set of uh, affordances, as a set of media, as a set of, um, and the kinds of meanings that can be expressed um, in speech um, and in text. Um, the other thing um, that we've been working on, which is again an idea inspired by Gunter, is this notion of synesthesia. So, um, uh, you know, across the human sensorium, um, what's interesting is text and speech could hardly be more different. So it's possible to isolate text purely in vision. Um, it's, it's possible to isolate um, uh, speech purely in, um, in sound. Um, uh, and all the other stuff that happens in between. So we've got this continuum, text through speech, and in the middle is image, space, object, body, sound. They're all intrinsically multimodal. But although text and speech can be multimodal as well, they can actually also be isolated. They are meaningful when they're isolated in terms of those particular aspects of the human sensorium. So then this is yet another reason why we want to separate radically um, text and speech. And in fact, what we do is we say language is an extremely unhelpful category because it aggregates things which are unhelpfully so aggregated, right? So we, we've, we've kind of been arguing that um, not only are we uh, deeply oppositional to the 20th century language turn, um, language is not a useful analytical category um, in, a, in a multimodal grammar. So, um, so when we go to synesthesia then, um, the question is one of movement across different forms of meaning. So our, proposi our proposition is that any one function of meaning um, um, can be represented across all of those forms. Um, but what, ha what happens is when you move across between one and the other, things change. Now, the word that Gunther used for that is transduction, which we thought is a, um, okay, it's a really important idea. I don't think he developed it as well as he could have. Um, um, maybe that's something he was about to do in this next book that he was about to write. Um, uh, but... Um, he did sort of begin to introduce the idea. But what we've done is we've tried to find a kind of a simpler word than that, a more straightforward word, and the word we've decided to use is transposition. So when you move from form to form with a meaning, um, what you do is um, you transpose one meaning from um, you know, text to image to uh, some sort of embodiment to speech to you know, whatever you go right through form to form involves transposition 
where you can mean the same thing and it's never the same. This goes back to the design idea about the fact that meanings are constantly moving, constantly shifting. So if you like, that's one axis of transposition from form to form. Um, but what we've also been done is, uh, like Gunter, we've gone back to the Halliday and metafunctions. Um, we decided to call them functions, form against function, rather than metafunctions, to be a little more straightforward about this, uh, perhaps. Um, and what we've done is we've renamed the three Halliday and metafunctions, but also we've taken things that are in Halliday and strata and put them in as functions. Let me explain what I mean. So what we say is there are um, uh, five functions. Meaning is always doing the following five things. Uh, reference, uh, agency, structure. They're like the three Halliday and uh, metafunctions. Um, we've added context to that, which is the concern of pragmatics and context is a, a stratum in the Halladayan system. And what we've done is we've renamed purpose as interest. Um, uh, um, so what we've done is we've said, look, these are five functions. And if you like, these are five questions you can ask about every, any piece of meaning in any mode. We want to build a grammar, a functional grammar, where we can use the same terminology to interrogate image, um, text, uh, embodied action, um, you know, the, the, all those forms that I mentioned before. So um, reference is what's it about, um, agency, who's acting, structure, how does it work, what, you know, um, how does it hold together, um, context is what's around it that gives it meaning, interest is what's it for. So there, these are relatively straightforward questions you're going to ask of all of those things, text, image, space, body, object, um, sound, speech. Um, um, but then what we want to do, and this is just trying to, to summarise two rather long books, um, is we want to try in this transposition idea is not only speak about transposition from form to form across that axis, but on another axis we want to talk about um, transpositions in terms of function. So, um, uh, you know, in terms of function, we can shift our attention between reference agency structure context interest. We can actually, um, uh, you know, we can, um, th they're all always there, but we can actually attend to one thing rather than another. But then um, within each one of these functions, what we don't find is categorical stability. What we find is incredible movement all the time. And um, one categorical reality kind of anticipating another uh, categorical reality. So, um, um, so that's a quick summary of some of the things we've been thinking. But again, I don't think any of that, um, it's on the same trajectory that we've been following with Gunter for all these, uh, or working with Gunter on for all these years. Um, but also, um, um, you know, what, we, we also have this strange sensation that there's nothing in the previous phases. If we go back to the genre work that we did in Sydney, or we go back to the multiliteracies work that we did, um, there's nothing that we would want to correct. Um, all we want to say is that there's more that can be said, and we're sorry that we can't be saying that we're going to still. <laughs>